Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. I've been really thinking about Seneca's words lately where he talks about how we really shouldn't just be imagining what will happen to us in the future, but we should imagine every single thing that possibly could happen. And as a result, we won't be surprised if it does come along. And I think that that's especially important in a time like now, you know, because there are so many different moving parts around the world. If you've been paying attention to global news, you know, obviously we all know about COVID. Uh, that's happening. We've got major global powers around the world uh, basically uh, getting in each other's business at the moment. We've got a lot of governments, uh, you know, basically saying that they want to move away from China because uh, of the the kind of uh, antics that are going on at the moment. Um, You know, we've got so many different things. Look at North Korea. Um, You know, there's so many different things that are moving around. And I think that it's important for us not to become scared of what could happen, but to have that healthy caution that the Stoics talk about. And one of the only ways that you can actually get that healthy caution is to look at the patterns of history and then to put those patterns over the lens that you're looking at now and see what could possibly happen uh, based on what we've seen happen in the past. And, And man, you know, we're in an interesting time, a really interesting time where I really think that more of us need to be prepared uh, for anything that could come about. Um, And so, again, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to do anything other than get an awesome guest on today who can teach us a little bit more about those patterns of history. And the guest that I have on today is Professor Joseph Siracusa. And the way we actually got this interview going is uh, literally Sunday or Monday, I believe. I was watching uh, watching a little bit of news on YouTube, and he came up on uh, an interview uh, with Sky News here in Australia. And and man, immediately I thought I've got to get this guy on my show because you know he's he's got such a great background in history and philosophy and in diplomacy and and government uh, government maneuvers and all sorts of things and and warfare and I thought man if I could get this guy on the show we could have a great conversation about what he's seen throughout his life and what that can teach us about what could potentially come about so I'll tell you a little bit about him and then we'll jump into the episode. So, Professor Joseph Siracusa was previously Deputy Dean of Global and Language Studies in the School of Global Urban and Social Studies at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Born and raised in Chicago and a longtime resident of Australia, Joseph studied at the University of Denver and the University of Vienna and received his PhD at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Uh, He has worked at Merrill Lynch in Boston and New York, uh, the University of Queensland in in, uh, Queensland here in my state, uh, and for three years has served as a senior visiting fellow in the Key Centre for Ethics, Law, Justice and Governance at Griffith University. He has authored and co-authored 310 refereed publications, including 75 books, monographs and chapters, 115 journal articles, entries and scholarly reviews, and 120 refereed proceedings. And his publications include the following, America and the Cold War, 1941 to 1991, A Realist Interpretation, Nuclear Weapons, A Very Short Introduction, The Death Penalty and U.S. Diplomacy, A Global History of the Nuclear Arms Race, Language of Terror, How Neuroscience Influences Political Speech in the United States. So those are just a few of the things that uh, Professor Siracusa has written. And uh, man, you can see that he is well qualified to be on our show and to be giving us a little bit of insight into history and philosophy and how that can teach us about what's to come. So without any further ado, I present to you Professor Siracusa. So, Professor, tell us a little bit about how you got into Stoicism to start off. And and then, uh, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been able to experience in your lifetime in terms of uh, really quite amazing historical events? Well, I heard all about it in high school. through I, I took Latin. I was probably the last bunch of guys to take Latin in high school. Uh-huh. It was Latin or, or Spanish or German. So I thought 
Latin was the right thing to do. And then we heard about Stoicism there. And then when I was 14, I was given uh, uh, the Meditations uh, by Marcus Aurelius. And what I liked about the book is it was small. <laughs> it was a yeah. small book. It was very encouraging. You know, when you're, you're young and they give you big books to read, you don't want to read a big book. This is a small book and had all these wonderful sayings. And then when I, uh, I went to university later and then I went to Vienna for a couple of years, I brought the book with me wherever I went. And yeah, it was always awesome. about... Yeah, but I, I I wasn't a student of Stoicism. I just, um, I, I I liked his name, and the name suited me, too, and uh, as it was intended. And the yeah. um, the thing is, is that um, uh, it, what he had to say was about real things, and I, I'm, I'm a pragmatic person by nature. You know, all the books I write about arms control, I say, look, the most important thing is not the truth, it's find a little bit of time. I always think that's important. Uh, I, one of the first books I wrote on nuclear weapons is called Real World Nuclear Deterrence, as opposed to all bullshit. And mm. I want to know how they really worked. And so you find yourself in that same groove that Aurelius was. He's looking for the same kinds of things. And the idea that this uh, entire philosophy should have uh, begun with a merchant who lost his ship is, is fascinating because, you know, how do you explain loss? Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, it's, these are very matter of fact things. Now, I, I did my dose of uh, university philosophy. Uh, you know, I, to this day, when I hear people talk about ontology, you know, I just want to crawl away. <laughs> 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 when I first got to RMIT in 2005, all these pseudotypes are talking about their ontological approaches. And I thought, you know, the average guy in the street doesn't know what you're talking about. You know, you, you got to use words that people understand. And so, you know, I, I've written about 40 books, which I'll tell you about, but they're all written in plain English, which just makes them very accessible. Yeah. And I use a word that pe people have to look up. And nor did Marcus Aurelius, by the way. He, uh, he, he didn't look for the 50 cent word. He used the five cent word. And so yeah. you learn how to speak to people in plain English and, and, and you get around the bullshit and the ideology. And I, I grew up in an ideological time, you know, during the height of the Cold War. And, Everyone was anti-communist, uh, and before that, they were anti-Nazi or anti-totalitarian, and and, and so um, I, and I I always thought that ideas are very powerful things, but if they drive your decision before you can think about it, you're in trouble, and, and mm. so you have to be very pragmatic. Now, look, let me just tell you a little bit. Um, uh, I, I was born and raised in Chicago. I was born in July 1944 when Franklin Roosevelt was still alive, Adolf Hitler was still alive, Franklin Roosevelt was being nominated for the fourth time down the block from the hospital where I was born. And, and uh, fascinatingly enough, uh, atomic weapons hadn't been invented yet. The atomic bomb hadn't been invented. So I always like to tell audiences that I, I, I had a chance to begin the world before nuclear weapons and World War II was over. Now, when you're a youngster, you know, you start seeing Harry Truman on great television screens, you know, with streaks on it and all the rest of it. And you start to put all the pieces together. So anyway, I grew up in Chicago at Ground Zero. Chicago consists of 77 uh, neighborhoods uh, in Cook County. This is leaving out greater Chicago than in the, the outside neighborhoods. But uh, mm. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, which today is a no-go zone. It was a pretty tough neighborhood in those days, too. And so it was working class. I grew up in a working class neighborhood. Uh, but... Mm. Uh, where where people were um, were very smart, you know. A lot of the CNN types, uh, they um, they don't like uh, what Hillary called the deplorables, and you know, and what what they forget is, and I think uh, who's that big guy, Mike, uh, the guy that does all the uh, movies about documentaries. You know, you you find out that uneducated people are not unintelligent. See, that's a, that's a problem a lot of people, a mistake people make. They, they think they're not really thinking. Well, they are thinking. And they resent people who think for them. And that was, you know, how Donald Trump got to where he is today. It, 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 he didn't have a movement. The movement found him. He's just a, a wrecking ball. So they'll go with him for a while. So anyway, I grew up in Chicago with all these self-made people. And um, at the age of 17 and a half, I, um, I went to Denver. Uh, on a train to go to university. And after a couple of years there, I went to go skiing too. I was going to have a good time. 
I was first my gen- generation to go to university. But this all before the Vietnam War, before the Civil Rights Movement. This is 1962. And mm-hmm. so I, I get to Vienna, and after a couple of years, I get to Denver, and after a couple of years, I meet a guy who's going to go to Vienna next September. And I said, that's a great idea. So uh, I went to the University of Vienna. I headed off on uh, at Pier 92 in, in New York, and I went over there and via London, and Paris, and places like that. And I studied comparative communist systems for 18 months. Now, I also ski on the weekends, you know, I'm not that nerdy. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to do something that nobody else was doing in America. I wanted to visit the Soviet bloc myself. I wanted to see, and you know, I was going to be the great explainer of, uh, of communism to the American people, because, you know, everyone's looking for an explanation. So I, I, I visited a, a number of the countries in the Soviet bloc, and for Vienna, you can do that easily. You go to Budapest for the weekend, you can go to uh, Prague for the weekend, you can go to East Germany. I went to uh, uh, near Poland, where I took the train to Moscow, and we, we did all these fun things. And when I got back, I realized that while a number of the people there were quite happy with their lives, that is personally happy, not politically happy, I, I realized something very interesting in 1965, and that uh, uh, nothing worked in the Soviet bloc because they couldn't come up with a price point. You know, supply and mm-hmm. demand doesn't work there. It's a command economy, so they say an umbrella costs 12 rubles. When it really costs 20, well, you're going to lose a lot of money for a long period of time. So I noticed that in 1965. Also, uh, when I was studying comparative communist systems, I used to take all these goddamn philosophy courses in, uh, oh, Marxism, Leninism, Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, uh, uh, Feuerbach, and Hegel. And I thought, Jesus, how does the average Soviet citizen, and I mean party member, how do they understand the dialectic? I mean, the, the philosophical foundations. Mm. So one day we're in class and we're going over the Soviet Constitution. And in this particular uh, iteration of the Constitution, I think Article 102 was, he, he who does not work shall not, he who does not work shall not eat. And I thought, well, that is the explainer, isn't it? You don't have to know anything about Marx or Engels or anybody. If you don't work, you don't eat. So they make it really simple. So that's, you know, 99, 95% of the society there uh, runs on survival. 5% were, uh, were the party. And uh, the Cold War dominated everything, including the nuclear arms race. And I'm very lucky in my lifetime, I got a ringside seat at the, uh, the Cold War. Cuban Missile Crisis, I got to meet negotiators uh, on both sides, and, you know, a number of players. Uh, and mm-hmm. and I, I got to see it close up. And in 47 years in my lifetime, the Cold War was over. In 73 years, that is from 1917 to 40, 1991, uh, that was the end of Bolsheviks, uh, Bolshevism. So I got to see in my lifetime the end of the Soviet Union. And it ended not with a, a bang, but with a whimper. So all the political scientists are wrong, which is why I never, never studied political science, because they don't know any history. They don't understand how things work. What they do is they take people's basic history, they, and then, then they do their modeling from it. And it's just, it's very, very primitive type history. You know, they don't get into archival material. They just get into a certain number of uh, superficial facts, et cetera. So anyway, I returned from Vienna. I go off to the University of Colorado to do uh, my doctorate uh, in the, on the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the rise of communism in Eastern and Central Europe. And the guy I'm going to study with has retired. Uh, his name is um, Thompson. He was the editor of the journal of uh, Central Eastern uh, Studies in Central Europe. And um, his replacement was this uh, arrogant Romanian former communist who had gone to Harvard. And when I went to see him, I thought I was going to be studying with this kind old guy. And what I got was this idiot who said to me, look, before I could study with him, and this is typical of Harvard when it goes west, he said, I'd have to know about nine languages. So I had a little bit of German, a lot of German, French, and Latin. He said, I'd have to know serbo croat I'd have to know uh, uh, Romanian, Russian, this thing, that thing, U- uh, Ukrainian dialect. And I looked at him yeah. and I thought, you got to be kidding me. I'll be an old man before I get out of this place. So the year is 1968, September 1968. So I went to the card catalog. You probably 
never seen a card catalog. And I looked at the, up the members of staff and what they'd done. So the, the two most published members of staff were Dan Smith and Bob Scottheim. Was, Dan Smith was a uh, prominent diplomatic historian. Scott Heim was a famous intellectual historian. So I combined the two together and, and I did a lot of intellectual and diplomatic history. So now it's 1971. I'm looking for a job. Uh, oh, it's actually December 1970 is when I graduated. And uh, I'm looking for a job. So I migrate to Boston and I go to work for Merrill Lynch, Chris Patterson Smith, a big brokerage firm. So, um, and of course, you know, I'd lived through the Vietnam War and I, I had been uh, uh, notified that it was my time to go. And after my medical exam, President Nixon had called off the draft. Uh, I got uh, a, a famous uh, uh, 15 minutes in my life. I got to meet Martin Luther King at the University of Denver. We recruited a number of people to work in Chicago about bringing down the barriers in de facto segregation. So I got to meet people like that. I have to say, in the 60s, very famous Americans, whether it's Bobby Kennedy or whether it was, you know, um, the civil rights people or whoever it was, they had time for students. They were very accessible and they were very generous with their time. And they also mm. wanted support. I mean, today, little tiny people in the Liberal Party wouldn't see you for a year or the Labor Party. You know, you could probably see Pauline Hanson in the morning, but. It's kind of a waste of time. And, and, and <laughs> you know, people, and, and same thing on the way to Europe. I got to meet a guy who became a prime minister. And I asked him in Parliament in, in a tour that he was giving us in 64. I said, how come Britain has never joined the European Union? And he said to me, in September 1964, he said to me, well, look, if we joined, uh, how would we ever get out of it? He said it would be just almost impossible. And, wow. and that was his reasoning then. And that's that, that Tory reasoning that lasted all those years and which persists to this day. It's still pretty hard to get out of. So anyway, I'm working at Merrill Lynch and um, I'm commuting between Boston and New York, 264 miles a day. So you get up at 4.30, you're on the six o'clock flight, you're at Wall Street by uh, eight o'clock in the morning, you have your donuts, et cetera, and then you come home and on the way home, you have two chicken wings and a glass of scotch and you do this for a year. And let me tell you, after a year, commuting by Eastern Airlines, that gets old after a while, very, very old. And so uh, I'm at Merrill one day and I get a phone call from um, Columbia University. There's a very famous genteel professor there who attracted a lot of radical students in his day, particularly the Brownstone Bombers, because he taught social history. And um, he, he, he calls me up and he says to me, his name is Jim Shenton, he says to me that my doctoral thesis had been nominated for the best thesis in American history, the best written thesis in American history by Professor Scott Heim, uh, unbeknownst to me. And he said, and while it did not win an award, he wanted to publish it. I thought, oh goodness, okay. So I left Merrill for the afternoon. I went over to Columbia to sign the contract. And, and while I was there, I, I, I met a guy from Australia who was a vice chancellor. I didn't know what a vice chancellor was. Never been to prison at the University of Queensland. And he said to me, look, we got a job. I want you to apply for it. Make a long story short, two months later, I received a, a telegram, and I still have the telegram, it invited me to take up this position at the University of Queensland to teach American diplomacy for the grand total of 7,440 Australian dollars. That was about uh, one third of what I was getting in New York. And I thought, well, why not? You know, I'd seen uh, in high school, I'd gone to see uh, On the Beach and I'd seen the Sundowners. And I know shit about Australia, but I thought it would be fun. And, you know, I, I like to say to people, when they say, where are you going on holiday? I mean, I've been here for 45 years. I always say, I'm, I am on holiday. Yeah. <laughs> when you, you come from Chicago and New York, and you go to a place like Australia where everybody's kind of upbeat, uh, except for this COVID-19 going on. And, and you feel like you're sort of uh, on holiday. Anyway, when I went to work uh, as a university lecturer, I, I realized after that I never had to work again because I was doing what I wanted to do. So it never felt like work to me. So at the University of Queensland, and it was, uh, I think it was one of 12 universities at the time, we had year-long courses. It was a golden age. 
Uh, everybody was a specialist in something. Had a lot of women and minority groups teaching, teaching Asian and Japanese history. And it was, it was a really fun place. And, and I had a lot of uh, famous students over the years. You can imagine between 1973, when I arrived February 2nd, 1973, uh, how many students you would have over a lifetime. So I've had thousands of undergraduates, hundreds of honor students, 43 PhD students, and um, and I produced my 40th book in New York, which I sent you. I think you, you may have gotten a copy. Did yep. I send you that copy? Yeah, you and, did. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's been a lot of time to think and write here, as a matter of fact. And of course, Brisbane being Brisbane, you get to know everybody, so you get involved in politics, you get involved in the Fitzgerald Inquiry, and you, get, you, you stick your nose where it doesn't belong in a whole bunch of places. So I was at uh, Queensland for um, about uh, 25 years. I, I had a fight with my last vice chancellor at the University of Queensland. Um, I thought he was a real cretin. And um, that's a good old word. <laughs> I, wrote a, I wrote a piece that went around Australia called the, gold, see, the Golden Age of the Humanities, the end of the humanities, something like that. And uh, it was about the end of the humanities, talking about all the corporate types who've taken over universities replacing scholarships with dean's bonuses and shit like that. This guy didn't like this at all, so he found some way to wedge me out. So I wound up at Griffith University for three years, and, um, and uh, working on counterterrorism, and then uh, I was offered a job here in Melbourne in 19, or 2005. So I went to Melbourne, and we've been very happy here, except for the last two months. I haven't really much been out of the house. And so uh, I had this wonderful experience of visiting or being part of Australia all these years from I arrived one month after Gough Whitlam was elected so I got to meet all the prime ministers and the foreign ministers and Australia is that place I was talking about in the 60s where you got to meet everybody uh, there was a time there in Australia where you, you, could, you could just walk up to Bob Hawke in a shopping center or, <laughs> or you could see um, um, a prime minister come out of a coffee shop. You can engage people on airplanes. And Australian ministers and prime ministers back in these times were, were, were very friendly. You know, uh, they quite open about the public. You didn't need a press secretary. I mean, today, everybody, the politicians and even the high academics are surrounded by bulletproof offices, minders and all that stuff. But there was a time the 70s and 80s in Australia, where you can meet nearly everybody. And I did, got to meet everybody. And then uh, a couple of years ago, five years ago, I got elected to the uh, uh, presidency of the Council for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, peak body. And this is the only country in the world, I like to tell people, where an expert on nuclear weapons can become president of the Council for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. <laughs> sort of a contradiction there, but I, I didn't much see it. and. Um, I've done radio and television over the years. If you just punch the button, you can see all the stuff I've been doing. And um, I, I've had a good audience. I mean, Australian audiences have been very fair to me. And um, I've had a very good time. So now I'm approaching the age of 76 in July. Is that right? I'm gonna be, uh, July 6 is my birthday born. Yeah, I'm coming up to 76. And I'm, I like to think I'm a young 76, but. You know, as people point out to me, if this COVID gets near me, I'm a particularly vulnerable group, so I'm trying to watch myself. On the other hand, um, I'm, I'm, I'm itching to get back out in the world as soon as this thing uh, falls away, and it will fall away sooner or later. And um, so I developed um, uh, a nice sense of Australian politics and position in the world. And I'll tell you what you do when you come from one place and you go someplace else, is you develop a different kind of perspective than people from the place you came. Now, it, it informs everything, your thinking, decision-making, your writing, your observations. So my writing has always had a little something special that is, uh, it's had that kind of Australian ingredient, that is that perspective, that wrinkle, that you get to see things differently. So when I, I wrote big books about the Kennedy administration, I wrote big books about the 20th century presidents, and bigger books about nuclear weapons and the history of the Cold War. While I was writing about using American and Russian and other sources, the perspective was always from Australia, the Australian perspective. So over a number of years, I wrote two or three good books in Australia about how Australia sees the world, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the American alliance. 
And my books are highly uh, quoted all over America, but never quoted in Australia. Figure that one out. <laughs> I always get a kick out of that. <laughs> Just, no, it's not, you know, there's a disease in the Australian academic life called NIH, not invented, not invented here. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can definitely, I can definitely see how that would be a thing. But uh, no, I, I, I appreciate you sharing all that with us because I think you know it's so good to hear that you've had you know this rich history where you've been able to see many different perspectives. You know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today. I wanted to have you on so that we could really discuss uh, the way that you've been able to perceive the world and all of the the history of what's happened while you've been alive. And, uh, and basically, I, I want to find out what that can teach us about uh, how humans act, what their motives are, uh, about what we can expect in the, in the future moving forward. Uh, because I, as you'll probably know from your study of Stoicism, uh, they really put a high emphasis on us really envisaging everything that could possibly happen in the future so that if it does happen, uh, then we won't be surprised, right? So, for example, with this whole COVID oh, yeah. thing, they would have said, well, you should be expecting that something crazy like this could happen so that when it happens, you're going to be fine. You'll figure it out. You'll be able to act virtuously, right? So you actually said in an interview recently, uh, you said that rethinking the future is really another way of asking, do you know where you've been? So I wanted to say, you know, we, we know where you've been now. We know the things that you've seen. What do you reckon you can tell us about what's, what's coming? Well, I, 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 I tell you what, it's interesting you say about those scenarios. So. Uh, when I'm not writing books, I'm writing uh, what became famous nuclear scenarios for Australia and other places. It's about wow. the worst possible day on Earth uh, after the bombs arrive. And yeah, so you're right. What, what happens the day scenario. the day that they make the decision to press those buttons? What does the world look like? Well, well, uh, the world will be not like the ICANN people talk about today. Talk about the humanitarian crisis. The uh, the guys who should have put a chill down your back are Carl Sagan and the physicists who developed or who analyzed and modeled nuclear winter in the 1980s. As the lights go out, agriculture stops, you get massive, uh, uh, massive hunger and things like that. Now, you don't have to be a genius to see that it takes about 30 nuclear weapons uh, to, to cause um, this, this earth, these earth shattering events. Now, during the height of the Cold War, there were about uh, 98,000 nuclear weapons, maybe a little more, strategic weapons, thermonuclear weapons. And about 90% of that was created by the United States and the Soviet Union. So I was always interested in what was the worst thing the Soviet Union and the United States could do with each other. Well, it was so bad on each side that they finally arrived at a doctrine called Mutual Assured Doctrine. That is, we won't have any defenses and you won't have any defenses because we know that life as it is will no longer be, that kind of thing. So um, you, you, you understand that. But look, mm. I, I, I want to say as I studied history and I wrote about history, and I don't think you know any history till you write about it. Uh, some people think they do. When I arrived, there were 17 people at, at the university, at La Trobe University studying American history, politics, and literature. Today, there are none. That's because they've replaced study with McDonald's. They think they know something about America because they stopped studying it. <laughs> yeah. But what you find out after a long life, and by the way, I, I keep saying to anybody who listen to me, I, I think the best days are ahead of me. I mean, I feel like Rocky, you know, I got five more rounds in me. But, <laughs> uh, you, you start to, you, you start to you get corroboration with things. For example, as I look back at the Cold War, and then the post-Cold War world is the war on terror. And as I got to meet important people like Governor Harriman, who negotiated limited arms trans, uh, the arms treaty, limited uh, in outer space. And then I, I got to cover um, Nelson Mandela's release from prison by Playboy magazine, sent me over there. And, and you start going to these different parts of the world. And in the last couple of years, I've been to Estonia, Lithuania to measure security conferences, Germany, and was invited to India six months ago and seen India for the first time. And you, you, you get to see that some things that you learn from antiquity haven't changed. For example, I believe in that Thucydides and uh, observation when the, the Athenian admiral goes to Milos and he tells him, stop supporting Sparta. 
and they give him some back talk. And he says, look, you don't have a say in this because the powerful do what they can and the weak do what they must. So you, you, you learn that. Uh, you see that repeating itself in different societies, whether it's you're looking at ethnic, race, class, culture, warfare, you know, the powerful always do what they can and the weak always have to modify or adjust. So mm-hmm. you, you, you learn that kind of thing. You also learn as you travel around the world that uh, William Faulkner's beautiful observation, I think that's from a book in the 50s called Requiem of a Nun. There's no requiem, there's no nun in the goddamn book. It's funny. But he's got a great <laughs> line. He's got a line in the book. It's about a woman who, uh, uh, who was uh, attacked one night. She, the guy she was with marries her because he felt guilty, he couldn't protect her and all this kind of stuff. A real Southern Gothic. And, 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 and Faulkner says in the book something that presidents sometimes repeat from time to time, like uh, Barack Obama. He says, uh, the past is not dead. He said, it's not even past. It, 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 as you travel around the world, you realize that we don't have this evolution. And then, then, you, then, it, then the penny hits that human nature has not changed in 2,500 years. The reason I know what Chairman Kim is going to do or what Trump is going to do or, or anybody anywhere, if you study human nature, you know there's only three things they can do. They can do more or less, more of something, less than something, or nothing at all. I mean, they only have three directions to move. They can just do what they're doing, do less, or do. I mean, and, and so it, it's easy to identify behavior. And, and so you find out that these truisms from antiquity actually uh, obtain in modern life. And most of the people today, and I've met a number of people in the Trump administration who are working on military doctrines and stuff like this, they don't know any history. You know, mm-hmm. and and I've been in major uh, major conferences with them, and they 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 talk like um, they discovered the wheel, um, and and, it, and I think it's very interesting because all these truisms you learn studying the, the antiquity prove to be true. As a matter of fact, I mean they have all this kind of life of their own. Now during the Cold War, I grew up with uh, Bert the Turtle, which. Uh, uh, decorates my little book I did for Oxford called Nuclear Weapons, a very short introduction. I grew up in the 50s with uh, uh, civil defense drills. Earth Turtle comes on the screen and says, if you want to avoid the worst part of a thermonuclear bomb, you just um, you duck and you uh, duck and cover as you put something over your neck. Well, actually, I didn't believe a word of that as we all were all in, under our desks. And so you, I think if you're a bright little kid, I was very bright in, a, in kind of a family of uh, very bright people, but they weren't interested in ideas. Okay, I was always, I was interested in ideas because I figured once I got my bicycle, I, I can go. <laughs> I can get so far away. Because, <laughs> you know, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see the rest of Chicago. I wanted to see the rest of America. I just was um, so one of these people who was driven by curiosity and, and everything I've written or seen is always driven by curiosity, which is very ancient too, as a matter of fact. And so uh, I, I, I grew up in a place where ideas were not particularly nurtured, but they weren't suppressed either, okay? You know, right. if you didn't want to argue politics, you just didn't talk about politics. You just vote whomever you wanted to vote for. One of the reasons uh, I voted Democrat all my life is because my father was a Republican. It was the only way to stick it to him. <laughs> the only way to get the leverage at the dinner table. As a matter of fact. So anyway, I, I see the Cold War, and it, it, it starts out as a, an ideological struggle. That is, and people have to decide by the late 1940s whether the Soviet Union is an ideology in the possession of a state or a state in the possession of an ideology, a messianic ideology. So is it a messianic ideology is taking over Russia or vice versa? So the United States decides that uh, it's a uh, uh, an expansionist ideology that has taken over the Russian state, anti-containment policy kicks in, uh, the, war, the United States is at war for the next 47 years, not against Russia or anybody, they're against communism. Whether it shows itself in Laos or Vietnam or in Korea, you know, they're fighting, they're, 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 or in Central America, and they're, they're fighting ghosts. They're looking at the expansion of communists. They see communists everywhere in terms of other people adopting communism, 
uh, as their defense against colonialism. So you see this everywhere. And so at the end of the, the, the Cold War period, uh, America's not exhausted, but there's a guy in office, uh, Ronald Reagan, who I, I wouldn't have voted for, I didn't vote for, and uh, I thought it was as dumb as hell. And, and at the end of four years, he was rattling on about the Soviet Union being an evil empire. He got, actually got caught in the iron, iron Contra scandal. And, and uh, he decided to actually meet a Russian leader. So there's a change in leadership over there. He has four meetings with Mikhail Gorbachev. And at the end, by the end of the fourth meeting, they decided to call off the Cold War. Now, what, what they meant by the Cold War, it's not the ideological struggles, which was the straitjacket that kept them from doing anything. What they meant by the end of the Cold War was the end of a nuclear arms race. There's a very interesting stat that applies to the Soviet Union too, though I have not seen it. Between 1940, the Manhattan Project in America, and the end of the Soviet Union, 1991 on Christmas Day, the third highest expenditure in American life behind Social Security and everybody's salary and state government or federal government and the military, third highest expenditure in American life was nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons research, and nuclear weapons platforms. Submarine launch ballistic missiles, airborne launch missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Third highest expenditure in American life was nuclear weapons. So by the end of it, by the last, the last 10 years of the Cold War wasn't really about ideas anymore. It was about the nuclear arms race. And we simply assumed in those days, that as American planners, that if the Soviet Union had a capability, they also had ipso facto the intention to use that weapon. Okay? It's a very important uh, uh, difference here because in the age of terrorism, we assume that people who, who have an intention actually have the weapon. Well, they don't. It's all bullshit. Now, but in the Soviet days, if they had a weapon that was uh, destabilizing first strike, then we just assume they intended to use it for that. 1950, the famous NSC 68 report said that the Soviet Union would attack America first within five years because by that time it will have a first strike capability and enough nuclear weapons in reserve. So that was the game from there on, was to beat the Soviets to a thermonuclear weapon with millions of tons of TNT and then to put them on missiles and rockets and all the rest of it. And then, you know, pretty soon they were miniaturizing them, suitcases, shells, uh, artillery, and stuff like that. And uh, by, by the time we get to the 80s, what, what we really have is an arms race. And so when Gorbachev and, and Reagan decided to call it off, these are now Gorbachev's determined, good communists, determined to re, revitalize the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Reagan, who was uh, uh, an enemy of the Soviet Union and never believed in a single arms agreement, decided to call the day with, uh, with, with nuclear weapons, with the exception, exception of a minimal force. So these guys, they, they, they called off because Reagan cannot figure out how to solve a basic philosophical question. And that question is, how do you deter nuclear war without threatening nuclear war? Okay. Reagan saw the paradox and it bothered him a lot. And that's why he spent billions of dollars on SDI, even though the goddamn thing would never work. Because he figured if we could neutralize nuclear weapons, we'll share it with the world. Now, on, on the other hand, uh, Gorbachev was determined to revitalize Soviet society through glasnost and perestroika. And uh, he, he knew that the military was lying all the time because the, uh, the uh, military was taking, the defense industry there was taking 22 cents out of every dollar, 22% out of every ruble. In the United States, I told you it's the third highest expenditure in American life. So, uh, Reagan wants to get rid of nuclear weapons because he can't live with the moral complexity of threatening worlds. And the other guy wants to get rid of nuclear weapons because he sees this as an impediment to the true revolution in Russia, the socialism, further socialization, socialism in Russia. So we got the Reagan and Gorbachev call off the end of the Cold War in my lifetime. I got to see the whole show. And we also had the end of the Soviet Union, but they're not connected, you see, in this sense. The end of the Cold War is a decision, conscious decision taken by Reagan and Gorbachev to call it a day. The end of the Soviet Union was the unintended consequences, the unintended consequences of Gorbachev's policies to reform the Soviet economy.
they, they just two different things. This is interesting because I was just at a conference uh, about nine months ago in uh, Lithuania with all these Russian dissidents and the oligarchs who've been in prison there. They assume that the end of the Cold War was uh, when Reagan had also maneuvered the end of the Soviet Union, which explains uh, Russia's revanchism today, trying to retreat or go back to what they were. And I tried to explain to these guys, good Russian citizens, all of whom want to get back to Russia, that the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union are two different stories. But over the years, they've conflated it because it then explains things, it explains things to them. And so a lot of societies, uh, so they sort of grab a narrative that explains it. That, that, it's easy to explain. No, they, they don't want loose ends. They don't want paradoxes or contradictions. You know, you know, Hitler did the same thing in the 20s and 30s. He said that Germany's plight was uh, uh, caused by um, the socialists and Jewish politicians and stabs in the back during the war, First World War. And the same thing with Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam veterans claim that the Americans uh, lost the war by the students at home, not on the battlefield, which is true, it was a major battle, and, and that kind of thing. People are looking for narratives that explain things. So uh, I got to see the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the War on Terror. When those buildings came down on 9-11, the American military industrial complex, as charitable as I want to be about them, saw the new opportunity. The end of the Cold War meant the end of Raytheon's profits, Northrop's, uh, you know, all, everybody who makes armaments or modernizing weapons, they saw this war going on. I thought, well, this is the next war. That's why the military industrial complex, they, they like endless wars because since 1945, the United States has been, uh, economy has been a sense of, been at war or in a state of permanent war. That is, mm. some people don't know how the economy works without preparing for war. In fact, the economy has been humming up to the last six months in America because of modernization of nuclear weapons, the modernization of American nuclear for American forces. So it's all about the, you know, 25, I think, of the 30 companies in the Dow Industrial Average are working with military contracts. I mean, it's not very hard to figure out why they're not unhappy with Donald Trump, because Trump's giving mm -hmm. them everything they want, as indeed uh, Barack Obama had to do the same thing. You know, if he wanted to get a comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, he, he had to promise Congress uh, modernization of nuclear weapons, which we're talking about trillions of dollars. So anyway, you, you get to see all these sort of cliches working out. I, I reckon what I've learned is that human nature doesn't change. The past doesn't change for many people. They just kind of relive it or they reinvigorate it or they transform it into something else, but it never really kind of, kind of, go, kind of goes away. And that you, you see uh, things like... Uh, you're looking for tricks of the eye, the unintended consequences. Now, people do things, but the opposite turns out to be get the opposite result. So you get all these kinds of things going on. And so you get to see sort of uh, um, uh, axioms in geometry turn out to be historical axioms. Mm. Uh, the past is never dead. In fact, it's not past either. And, and human nature hasn't changed. And, you know, people today argue with social media, and you might be one of them, that everything's changed, it's changed the nature of the game. Not really. It may speed up some things, but it doesn't change how people think and how they act or react and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, mm. I, I think uh, human nature is pretty easy to understand if you understand that it hasn't changed. As I was yeah. joking with someone today about uh, uh, Dr. Freud would understand that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think, I think that, that's a really great point, right? This idea that humans never change. And, and you actually mentioned a quote from, uh, from, I believe it was Mark Twain in one of your interviews who said uh, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it always rhymes, something like that. It rhymes and, a uh, lot. Yes, it does. That's it. Yes, and, it does. And, and I was also reading a quote from Marcus Aurelius today, even you know, he was saying, uh, that nothing changes. It's just the same thing repeating itself over and over again. You even look at, say, the ancient stories of the Bible. It's like the repeated story over and over again. People get super prideful, then they fall. People get super prideful, then they fall. And you see these stories in, in, in ancient history and in, in modern history as well. It's just a constant cycle of humanity, uh, you know, being absolute absolutely ruthless and then maybe a little bit of peace and then absolutely ruthless. And what I'm interested 
uh, and I think you can give us some insight on this is, is where you think uh, history might start to rhyme in the future, right? Because, uh, you know, with each new massive war that's taken place in the world, we've obviously seen new technologies come into play. Um, and uh, some might say that, you know, maybe human beings just have this biological, uh, I guess, uh, tendency. We obviously have a biological tendency for survival. And so maybe that's going to be the thing that stops us from completely annihilating ourselves with nuclear weapons. But uh, I've been very interested lately in thinking about what's going to be the new nuclear weapon. You know, what's going to be that thing that comes out in the next war? Is it going to be, um, is it going to be information warfare? Is it going to be data warfare? Is it going to be biological warfare? Cause there's all these crazy things that are coming into play right now. Right. So, so what do you think um, based on what you know? Well, about I've got a, I got a, I have a series in New York that I edit. I did yep. the first book in the series called weapons of mass destruction. Mm. And uh, the book is about uh, nuclear and biological and chemical weapons and how they mm. could all be game changers. Um, the series this year is going to be renamed Weapons of Mass Destruction Plus D, that is disruption, that is cyber warfare, which yeah. is on the cards. I mean, you know, with, with cyber warfare, you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to sink an American aircraft carrier. All you have to do is stop the toilets from working. Stop yeah. the electronics. Or, or I mean, change the minds and hearts of people within the nation, right? I mean, you can spread information pretty quickly and pretty easily. Uh, I mean, one example I can give you straight away is uh, a couple of days ago, Australia launched uh, this COVID safe app, uh, as you know, you know, and so everybody um, has to download this app and, and it's going to basically uh, supposedly help people to stay safer. Um, but already I've seen on social media, uh, these fake posts going around showing that, um, that the app is supposedly saying, you know, you're within 20 kilometers of this place acting as if the app is actually tracking people and, and tracking their, yes, their yes. whereabouts. And yes. so already, well, I'm already within- si- I already signed up for the app. <laughs> I already on the app. I mean, all the app is going to do is tell you if you were near somebody who had a problem. And if you don't like the app, you can leave the phone at home or you can turn the goddamn thing off. Yeah. It's not like it's but, but my only point is that it, it that already there's misinformation being spread, you know? And so it's, it's, it's obviously so easy for whether it's individuals, governments, whatever, to spread this information around. Uh, well, so couldn't you potentially uh, see the whole, you know, hearts and minds of nations changed over the future, just, but just due to mi- misinformation. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Now, in a sense, it's important because it can move around very quickly. On the other hand, it's been with us a long time. The American colonists thought there was a conspiracy. That is, George uh, the Third's uh, ministers were keeping the truth from him about the, the true good virtues of the American colonists. They didn't want to pay the goddamn bills anyway. And um, uh, and 73 times during the Cold War between 1945 and 1991, the Carnegie Mellon Institute of whatever showed that the United States 73 times tried to interfere in uh, major elections overseas in the Soviet bloc, okay? And mm. so this idea of interfering in each other's lives, whether it's Radio Free Europe or Russian television today, I mean, trying to distort the truth. Now, mm. in the case we say the Russians are doing this full time, why? They want to weaken American society and to drive a wedge between America and NATO to break that alliance, to, to break the sanctions regime against them. So people start to imagine that all these trolls, et cetera, all have a, a single goal. I mean, there's a whole probably football field of people uh, with misinformation. But look, the people who are going to vote for Joe Biden don't spend much time on social media, okay? So you can tell them any story you want. But uh, getting Americans or anyone to believe the story. Rumors play a very big role, whether in Australian life or America in the First World War, the Second World War. I mean, uh, uh, you know, is it true that uh, Roosevelt knew that the, Russia, the Japanese were coming for Pearl Harbor, but said nothing because it was his back, his, his back door into the war because the Germans wouldn't declare war against them? You know, and, and so this misinformation has gone on for a long time. Now, I think in the future, we're going to have a, a lot more disinformation, but I don't know, you know, you're a bright guy and I know bright people. I mean, uh, if someone tells you and that, uh, the, the, you know, something's upside down, you, you, you know, it's not right. There's something wrong with it. But in, in, I suppose in a crunch, 
you can hear rumors. I heard after John Kennedy was murdered, and I was a student, second year at university, and, you know, day one it was the mob, and then it was uh, the Cubans getting even with them, and then it was uh, Jimmy Hoffa's people, the trade unionists, and, um, and the list went on and on and on. In fact, I was able to declassify the, all, all the FBI telegrams, all the FBI uh, wires to each other about working with the Russians on this. And the Russians wanted us to know that uh, they had nothing to do with it and they wanted to help, et cetera. And some people thought that was just a feint because the Russians did have something to do with it. So, you know, rumors are always going to percolate. What I worry about is this cyber warfare turning off the traffic in mm. downtown uh, New York on New Year's Eve. What I worry about is chemical warfare. What I worry about is the variations of COVID-19. It's just a pathogen that could easily be passed on a small weapon and explode in a major city and kill thousands of people within minutes. The, the, this, um, uh, this COVID-19 crisis, as awful as it is, it is really kind of a fire drill for maybe nuclear war or chemical or biological yeah. warfare. I have a very bright woman who's doing a PhD for me, who's a, a biologist. And uh, she's been uh, talking for years about how easy it would be able to develop pathogens to sweep through a society. I mean, look at this. This, this, this pathogen has emptied, uh, has, has forced aircraft carriers to go home to their ports. It, it's forced people off the streets. It's driven major cities uh, on their knees. It's, it's pummeled economies everywhere. It stopped education, of commerce, and business. I mean, this, this goddamn thing, this plague, has brought everything to a standstill for a while. Uh, and so it, it, it would, you should tell a terrorist what the options are here for biological warfare. They're enormous if they think about it. You know, who needs nuclear weapons when you can bring society to a halt for what? Two dollars and ninety nine cents, or whatever these things cost, to, you know, to develop uh, in, in, in mass. So I worry about cyber war, uh, cyber uh, cybersecurity warfare, and I worry about biological warfare, maybe chemical warfare. But the big one is the one that we we have the least control over. I think is nuclear weapons, because you said you know you know uh, it, it, nothing changes. Well, at the end of the Cold War, there was this little. Uh, theory that the international relations people told everybody that the United States was a unipolar, a unipolar power. It could do whatever it wanted. It was a hegemon. This allowed all the international relations people in the world, from John Mersheimer or whoever, to say that the United States is in complete control of the world. Now, that's crap. We couldn't get North Korea or Persia or Iran to do anything anybody wanted them to do. Nobody can make little Australia do what they want to do, or Austria, or the European Union. You know, the idea of the United States was a hegemon. What it was, was, it was kind of the last major player standing while everyone regrouped. And today, what we have is the Cold War has yielded to the sort of hiatus between 1991 and 2001. And what we have today is the revival or the return of the great power competition. We are back to where we were in 1914. Four or mm. five major powers with the balance of power uh, to tip things over. And once again, it's, it's going to be about alliances as much as the president does a lot like alliance, doesn't like alliances. Or as I tell European audiences, every time the president bitches about international organizations, is on the sidelines of, of their events. <laughs> he just, whether it's G20 or G7 or NATO, he only complains about them when he's there or Davos or whatever it is. And so yeah. uh, we returned to the great power competition and we got the same, uh, we got the same dynamic today that we had in 1914. And what I mean by this, uh, between 1870 and 19, 18, uh, 1871, are you there? Yep. Disconnected. Uh, my phone fell, but I'm gonna replace it here. <laughs> Okay, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, now, in, 19, in, in, in 1890, um, uh, Bismarck Lee is the German Foreign Office, and uh, he, 
He had a nightmare every night for 20 years when he was in control of the Second Reich. He, he was trying to avoid a two-front war. And to him, the world was five major players. The Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Brits, the French, and the Italians. And he said the, the idea to survive in a world of five great powers, and today we have five great units, is to be a trois. And, and so when Russia finally started with um, France in the, um, the 1890s, he knew that his time was over because if Russia and France combined again, they could attack France on two sides. And so the German response, which was turned to, turn to diplomacy over to the military, who designed a, a war of annihilation to take out the French quickly and then turn and get the Russians again, finish off the Russians secondly. So this great war of annihilation, which was the first uh, modern wars of annihilation, and they were fearful, uh, and became the, the predominant thing. We've returned to that today, this mm. five powers. We got the European Union, we got America, we got China, we got Russia, and the rest of Free Asia, okay? And mm -hmm. uh, those are the five major units. So once again, uh, Bismarck's advice is very wise, or remain a trois, if you're a part of the three big units. But right now, Russia's working night and day to, make, to, to drive a wedge between the Americans and, and, and Europe. And you could say they're doing a pretty good job, and I, I don't know. Uh, the, the NATO alliance has gone on for, what, since 1949. But keep in mind that the NATO alliance was the first permanent alliance the U.S. had entered into in peacetime since 1800, when they broke their alliance with France. So America went 149 years before they had another peacetime alliance. America going it alone is really... The, the, the normal story. In the 1920s, Warren Harding turned his back on Europe, turned his back on the League of Nations, and it was about uh, return to normalcy, whatever the hell that was, and it was about uh, returning his back on Europe's and Asia's political problems. He wanted, he wanted to trade with them, Asia and Europe, but he didn't want to, he didn't want to borrow their problems. So this, this turning their back on, on the world, this is just kind of a rhythm in American society. You know, and, and one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is the generational thing. Now, at the end of 73 years, Bolshevism is gone. Well, what is 73 years? Uh, Max Weber says a generation is, what, 18 years. About five mm -hmm. generations later, they have no memory of the First World War or the yeah. heroism of the Red Army, and they figure, you know, what the shit, we're, 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 this is a different game, so to speak. And it could be. And that maybe China today isn't as great a superpower as people think. First of all, all their loans are lousy. <laughs> They're leveraged to death. And the, and the Belt and Road they have out there, they got billions of loans in dollars and loans. They're never going to collect. And as I said to a high-level delegation from Beijing last year, I said, look, you got all these, these loans. You're never going to collect them. You're going to buy a little influence for 10 minutes. But when you want your money back, they're going to throw you out of the country. So your great Chinese efforts to get people to love you will turn into a great uh, xenophobic uh, campaign by Africa and Asia. Anyway, they, they said to me, you know, the, the West is concocting ways to humiliate China. So the Chinese always go back to the historical humiliations to explain what they're going to do next. So the history does mean a lot. But look, the world that we face in the future is a resurgence of a great power competition. And that is where each nation plays its national interest. And Australia is a really interesting place because the story in Australia is, you know, one day we'll have to choose between uh, Beijing and Washington. Yeah. Well, that was the same question America had in the early 1800s. Would it have to choose between revolutionary France or would it have to prefer, prefer its older trading colonial partner? Britain, you know, America was torn between Paris and London. Well, at the end of the day, they decided to play their own game. Uh, not very well for a while because you know, they were a very delicately fragile, <laughs> fragile state for a long, long time. They don't want to pick a fight with both of them. So Australia's got this problem. You know, what kind of China is going to be there tomorrow? And mm -hmm. I've heard half of uh, 
uh, Australia doesn't really worry much about China. The other half frets a great deal. Uh, and uh, I, I saw the Chinese ambassador point out to me, I said, the Chinese ambassador has, uh, has threatened to pull their students, Chinese students, and investments out of the country if uh, Australia makes any more noise about an international inquiry into the origin of the COVID-19. And um, that's the game that'll be played. It'll be socioeconomic. China has leverage. Does it want to use leverage? Not really. I mean, China's always been a big supporter of uh, letting individual states do what they want to do. I mean, that's, that's been their thing in the UN since they got in the 60s, that uh, there, cannot be no inter- there can be no interference in the life of a state. Of course, mm. the second part of that corollary is if the state isn't hostile to China, then they can find a very different reason to make trouble for them. So to answer your question, we've gone from the superpower rivalry to unipolar world to a world of great power competition. This is the return to this, this, this classical world, classical balancing uh, diplomacy, which is the only answer to war. Now you're right, as a species, we are the only creatures on earth that go at each other at the rate we do. You know? And the only reply to that is diplomacy. So mm. in addition to focusing on nuclear weapons, for the last 25 years, I've also written important books on diplomacy, which I see is the only way to mitigate or nullify nuclear weapons. I mean, unless we have nuclear diplomacy or other kinds of diplomacy, we're only going to get in a position where people will want to use these things. And I think diplomacy is important because it, it, it sort of uh, waters down uh, uh, the, the conflict that people are having with each other at a lower level. Because the lower level conflicts, whether it's tariff or immigration, uh, poisons the, uh, the chalice. And so mm. it poisons the big issue. That's why the little issues, they just, that's why the little issues brought on World War I, whether it was economic nationalism or trade or whatever it is, it poisoned the big issues when the time came. So I see the world moving in that direction. Social yeah. media is important, but rumor, the rumor mill has always been important. And you know, we got a name for that, Simon. We call it the intelligence. I mean, people have been gathering intelligence since biblical times. And part of that intelligence is disinformation or deniable plausibility. So, you know, people have always been on the lookout about how you can use ideas to influence the other side. In the 1960s, a man I met uh, invented the word public diplomacy. Today, that word is known as soft diplomacy. And uh, public diplomacy breaks all the rules of diplomacy, that is, it allows states to interfere in the thinking and lives of citizens of countries you are accredited to. Now, of course, they call it soft diplomacy, influencing publics to get their governments to do things that you want them to do. Soft diplomacy, I think, is much mis- misunderstood. I think uh, uh, the, the public diplomacy is a much better model for, a much better title for looking at those kinds of things. So diplomacy mm. will play an increasing role as we try to avert uh, these larger issues. Uh, and of course, yeah. the other thing too is, you know, the, 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 when I was a student in the 60s, we had all these people talking about the human race was getting too big. You know, four billion people, three and a half billion people. What is it today? 7.4 billion. And, and of course, uh, with the uh, pro-life movement taking hold in American government, People can no longer talk about uh, trimming down the birth of nations with, with aid or trade or even family planning. You had to talk about something else. So we've got these huge populations. And, uh, you know, when Al Gore is doing that great little inconvenient truth thing and he shows this uh, carbon dioxide going up in the air, uh, he, he had a chart off to his right that I couldn't take my eyes off. And that was the, the population, growth of the population. It's just not only about the misuse of fossil fuels, it's about how do we get people not to want an automobile, whether you're a kid in India or Brazil or China, you know, mm. you want your car, you want this, you want that, you want cheaper goods. And so we got all these people uh, who demand more and more things. I mean, look as you go around the world, look at just what air conditioning does in a, in a skyscraper. Imagine the energy that, that takes in, you know, 24 hours of packing air conditioning. Anyway, we got, we got all these people. We have uh, smaller resources. The UN 
a head of food security is predicting that there are 240 million people today who are marching towards starvation. There are 130 million who have already arrived at starvation. So you got food security, you got water security, you have energy security. So you got all these friction points everywhere. And, and you got some people trying to solve them. Other people have given up on them. And I'll tell you a secret I've learned dealing with governments over the years, whether it's about nuclear planning or this thing or that thing. Most governments do not have a plan B for anything. <laughs> it's not because they don't give a shit. It's just they don't know how to deal with it. It's just, it's just too big. They don't know how to deal with apocalyptic conditions, whether it's, you know, and, and you know, next to nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear war, <laughs> we got the waters rising. You know, when, when the global uh, warming clicks in and, and the tides rise six, seven, eight, ten feet, and Bangladesh, India, New York, I don't know, half the world, I mean, the coastlines are disappearing everywhere. And you got millions of people trying to find dry ground. And, you know, I know where they're going. They're going wherever there's space. And so Australia's going to have to look at that one down the road. So we got the, uh, I always, the, the COVID thing has told us a little bit about how the world reacts to a major catastrophe, but yet it's just the, it's, it's a dress rehearsal for a nuclear war and it's a dress rehearsal for global warming, which is coming. There's just no yeah. doubt about it in my mind. We got all the, uh, all the indices are in place and they'll fall over like dominoes when the time comes. I was mm. told here in the, in the Melbourne area, down in Port Melbourne in the south, uh, South Bay, it used to be swamps in, I don't know, 1780s. And so the water will come in, and all these high rises will be overtaken. And, and, and you know, and, and some prepper uh, in the States said that the day was coming where Americans would kill each other for a can of peaches <laughs> when the food runs out. And of course, what he was saying was that these, these crazy preppers in America were ready for COVID-19 except they didn't know what it would be called. You know, they had their food and they were hunkered down someplace and they were all ready for the end of something. And then, you know, let me just throw religion in here a little bit. You know, a lot of these evangelicals are in high places in the United States. So when they threaten nuclear war, they don't care about something else and millions of people are dying. And we come close to what looks like an apocalyptic condition. They don't care. I mean, these guys dream of end of days. They can't wait for the reckoning. I mean, they, they don't care. They just bring it on. We're ready. There's only two things that they have to be ready for. And that was they have to make sure Israel is in place, according to Revelation. And they have to make sure that they're ready to meet their maker. And if it ends by global warming or pathogens or, or, or nuclear weapons, they don't care because it is the end of a prophecy. Now you might say these guys are loony, but they're actually now four out of every, maybe 10 votes in the United States. And they're in high places. Mike Pompeo is a, is a born again Christian. Half the people around Trump are evangelicals, though he wouldn't know what the hell they are because he's, he's love church and so. And, and so we got a lot of people who, who don't care if mutual assured destruction works, or if this works or that. They're not afraid of the end. Now I'm not afraid of the end. But, you know, I think you got to do everything you can not to get there sooner than you have to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think we have that kind yeah. of obligation. <laughs> and, but yeah, and, uh, they're not afraid. You know, I, th I think that it's so interesting what you're saying. And what, what, what really sticks out to me are two things. Firstly, that this is a dress rehearsal. I think that that's actually a really accurate summary. And you might say that we have a lot to, uh, we have a lot of work to do in order to get better at that dress rehearsal. But, but something else is, is, you know, I, I, couldn't agree more that I, I feel as though we are at a kind of a crossroads right now where we have to take a look at the world and say, uh, you know, we need to be prepared, which is why we're studying philosophy, right? It's to prepare our minds for any eventuality so that we know that we can, you know, maybe be one of the citizens who, uh, who maybe acts in a better way and doesn't necessarily kill, um, you know, for, for a can of beans. But, um, but, but, you know, I think that what's really important right now is to recognize that there are so many different moving parts in the world. There's governments, as you say, there's religion, there's economic issues, there's environmental issues, there's, uh, you know, there's poverty, there's, there's so much going on right now. 
that we really need to kind of look at ourselves and say, we, we need to be prepared for anything like the Stoics said. And there's this great quote from Seneca where he, where he's basically describing uh, what it looks like to see an extremely angry person and, you know, gnashing of teeth and furious and absolute insanity. And often when we talk about this in Stoicism, you know, we kind of say, well, look, we don't, we obviously don't see things like that today. So we don't really need to worry about getting that bad. But the thing is, we don't see things like that today because we're not around people like that today. But in reality, there are still people right now in the world who would kill for a can of beans because of their situation, right? Yeah, Thomas Jefferson said about Latin America, he said the reason they would not really uh, emulate the American experience, because he said in Latin America, everybody is either a a, a hammer or an anvil. And, you know, you got these extremes. I've just returned mm. from uh, uh, three or four days in New Delhi, 22 million people. And I saw wealthy people walking over poor people who were dying, starving. I saw really educated, caring people who are running sustainability institutes who couldn't give a shit about their fellow, fellow man, starving out in front of the, the convention center. You know, you start, and, and, you know, when we have this COVID thing around the world, uh, my favorite question, is where are the billionaires? Where are they hiding? Where are all the people with the money hiding? And, and, and what this crisis has shown us, at least in America, maybe even in Australia and other places, it shows us the fissures in society, class, ethnicity, race, gender, and who's going to go, who's going to go first. And uh, I, I think the reason that the uh, ruling classes haven't thought much about global climate change, that is what to do about it. You could say, well, you know, they're kind of paying attention, et cetera, et cetera. I think at the end of the day, they don't give a shit how it works out as long as they and their uh, power elite survive. Because they reckon, well, you know, uh, four, four million of us are better than 10 million of them. You know, we, we, we got the money, the time, and we know how to do things. Now, you've actually, when you talk to me uh, about Seneca, you reminded me of the next great profession. I, always, I, I, I talk about nuclear weapons, terrorism, and, and diplomacy. And I always say that when things happen, they're all connected, but we no longer have curiously driven young people at universities or think tanks anywhere who connect the dots. See, yeah. no one bothers to connect the dots from Marcus Aurelius to George Washington, who read Marcus Aurelius, or Thomas Jefferson, on to other people who read Mark. They, they want to read, uh, they want to connect you to Machiavelli, which was on uh, Stalin's bedside table. Uh, there, there, there are very few people who connect the dots. You know, they say that uh, in Pearl Harbor, we had all the information we needed, but no one connected the dots. Same thing with 9-11. We had all the damn information we needed. Today, we got global climate change. It's coming down on us like a tsunami, and no one's connecting the dots about what's going to happen next. So if I were to go in front of the Melbourne State Library and say, look, our day of reckoning is coming, I'd probably be regulated under the Mental Health Act by 9 o'clock tonight. It's some <laughs> nut case. And, but, you know, we, we, we should be producing people who can make connections. Who are these people? These are people who are curious, who read widely, who, 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 who know why great things emerge and why they fall. You know, my money's on, on people who watch the Game of Thrones. They know exactly how the game is played, you know? <laughs> it's about politics and a struggle for power. International politics is the struggle for international power. It's beating the shit out of the other guy to get a head start for something else. This game is as old as, 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 as the Greeks, you know? This game's been around a long time, but we no longer have very thoughtful people around who connect the dots. And I, when I say the politicians, I mean Australian, Austrian, Hungarian, American, Russian. They don't have anybody who reads or remembers history. You know, everything, mm -hmm. they're like dogs. They learn from their own experience. They have no idea that they're in a loop and they're going to do the same damn things over and over again. Whereas the yeah. Spanish philosopher says at Harvard, if you don't know your history, you're just you're condemned to repeat it over and over again. But I, I say, you know, the, the, the thing that we're missing today are analysts. We got a few, not many. Uh, they don't uh, have revered places and not paid much money. And uh, we, uh, 
uh, we, we don't have anybody who connects the dots. We give a lot of money. I mean, we pay a lot of money to, to people who got angles, who can screw somebody out of some money, or whether it's uh, uh, those, those things they were developing in the United States uh, to sell houses for 10 cents. Uh, you know, it, we're, we're looking at the wrong things. And, mm. you know, when I, I, I think of Australian universities, just think about this, and I've been here for 45 years. Nobody likes Australians. The, the liberals don't like it because they don't like ideas they may have to uh, implement. The labor doesn't like it because the trade unions don't trust the intellectual. And the National Party doesn't like it because they don't read. They don't know what they do, aside from agricultural degrees. And so um, people here don't count on the thought people to solve any problems. And therefore, they don't want to hire their students right away. You know, mm. unless they have a law degree or whatever. And so the, the places that should be uh, kind of the, the hotbeds for how to solve the future are, are, don't work that way. We're talking now about producing students who are, oh, I love it. Uh, Obama said shovel ready. <laughs> who <laughs> go to some job right away and make yeah. money. We don't have anybody who studies philosophy anymore. In the United States, only I think 4% of the kids entering university study history anymore. When I was mm. a student, it was about 27% because there ain't nothing in understanding history or the philosophy of history or, or that kind of thing, you know? It, it's been downgraded and downgraded. And um, uh, people would rather study political science. Political science, I are people are wrong all the time. But I'll tell you what, they got moxie. They got moxie. <laughs> they just go on television, radio, and in books, and they predict the future. And look, yeah. if you and I predict the future, we can go 50-50 each way, okay? We'll be, one of us will be right. Yeah. <laughs> but they do. Is they, they, historians are too modest. They know too much history to predict history. Now, there's mm. a guy who's just been here from Cambridge at the Adelaide Film Festival, whose book was a big hit in Europe called Sleepwalking, as how we're walking right into the next war based on sleepwalking in World War I. That is, uh, people just walked into it. They didn't understand what was going to happen. That's because no one's connecting the dots. Mm. So, you know, when I say connecting the dots, I mean, we don't have enough people studying philosophy or history yeah. or, or human nature, you know, or, or these kinds of things. They're, they're doing all this other stuff. You know, God bless them. I'm sure they'll get to the right point for something. But we don't have anybody connecting the dots. So when things happen, I'm always very hard on intelligence agencies to say, well, nobody can get it all. Well, I'm sorry. You know, it turns out that every time something bad happens, it turns out we actually knew about that person, but, but no one connected the dots and no one followed through. And so, you know, trying to save the human race now is, is, is a job for is eternal vigilance now. We have to be on, look out for the angles to, mm. to, to dent things or to uh, mitigate things. And are people going to do that kind of thing? I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I always teach my students to have a foot in history and philosophy and a foot in the real world so they can bring to bear the ancient world to the present world. And that's why I say human nature hasn't changed because everything, the Romans and the Greeks and, 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 and the Egyptians, every damn problem they had will be the, pro the same kinds of problems we have. Mm. Hunger, lust, conquest, you know. What do you do when you've conquered these people in Gaul? Do you make them citizens or not? And, you know, the fact that Australians throws its immigrants into the ocean. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you a little story here that I thought was fascinating. Um, I covered Mandela's release for Playboy magazine in 1990. It's just a little gig I got in my, sometimes I, I leave my academic desk and I go to the real world. And, and so I had this great opportunity, fly first class too. And uh, so I got over to South Africa and Mandela's taking about 11 days to leave his cottage. He had a cottage with a swimming pool and tennis court, and he was cutting this deal with a clerk. So I traveled around South Africa to talk to people at the universities and the streets and things like that. And this guy at the University of Stonebush, he was a Queens, uh, he was an advocate, a former Queens council before uh, and South Africans went on their own way. And he saw my credentials, Australian Playboy, uh, and, and he puts his finger in my chest. And um, he says, you know, we, we resent you Australians. And he resented not being able to play rugby. Uh, he resented being boycotted by Australian universities. He resented the boycotts in Parliament. 
you know, during the uh, last years of apartheid, the Australian, the South African ambassador to uh, Canberra uh, had nothing to do. So he went to Queensland. He did his PhD with me. <laughs> so I got to meet him. And, and he <laughs> kept me off. He kept me off that Mandela was being released. So I called Playboy and I said, uh, wow. you know, I got the tip off. I want to cover the story. So anyway, I'm with this guy at Stonewash. He's got his finger in my chest and says that Australians have really fucked his country over. And then he says to me, you know, when Mandela gets out, gets out tomorrow, he said the world will never pay attention to Australia, to South Africa again. You know, this is the story. This is the big story. When he goes, no one will be interested in South Africa, which is essentially correct. So he says, but, he says, you watch in the years ahead when the poor and the impoverished and the desperate start making their way to Australia on little boats and you are going to shoot them out of the water and you're going to kill them. You won't want them. They'll be venom as far as you're concerned, lepers. He says, then the world will see Australia for what it really is, no better than we are, keeping the other away. And I looked at him and I thought, Oh, you know, the, the day that Australia becomes the object of moral opprobrium for pushing immigrants away or migrants or asylum seekers or whoever. And I thought, wow. And here I am all these years later thinking, I got a spot on. He could yeah, see, yeah. he could see what was coming. And, yeah. and we were too stupid to see what was coming. And so nobody had a plan. So it was a default plan, lock them up somewhere, maybe we won't see them or something like that. So, yeah. you know, as the world starts to close its borders, it's not just about pathogens, it's about Mexicans, it's about Syrians and Afghans. I, I read the other day that there's something like 370,000 people, this is before coronavirus, 370,000 people are displaced every day in the course of a year, mm. either by war, violence, famine, water, whatever it is, they're displaced. That's a lot of folks on the road. Now look, yeah. in history, we've had large migrations all over the place at different times. That explains a lot of things, actually. But, um, you know, we need people today who can connect the dots. So if you go to your, your high school counselor, and, you know, you're six, 16, 17, you say, look, I want to go to the university. I want to go someplace and connect the dots. They don't know what you're talking about. Then you go to universities, and there are very few degrees called connecting the dots, but um, it should be. Yeah. And, and those dots are, you know, the end of philosophy taught on campuses, except for a few places, the end of history taught on campuses. Today, history's got this kind of uh, uh, melange called uh, international studies, international history, global. It's got this kind of vague name mm. to cover different fields, et cetera. But the, the pure study of history, which allows us these insights kind of Marx had and Engels had and, you know, Thucydides had. They could see how history works, that reconstruction of the past. And, you know, anybody can see that there's a lesson to be learned. Could be a mm. small lesson, could be a big lesson. And, and I said, I always get a kick out of watching these kind of sci-fi, great Game of Thrones type movies. They all have the same story. It's about the rise of power. Yeah. The... Uh, the, the, the pride that goeth before the fall, and then it's the dissolution of power. You know, it's like that great book um, about Sicily in, in uh, the 18, I think, 1880s, 1870s, uh, called the Leopard, the Lampedusa. And there's this revolution in Sicily, and people die. And this one guy says to the other, why'd you kill those people? He says, we had to kill somebody, because it's everything's going to stay the same. I want to be one of them. You know, it's like <laughs> people go through this minuet of killing off the ideas and the people they don't like so they can continue being the same fools they were in the first place. It's, it's like mm. it, it never mm. ends. And that's what I mean by human nature doesn't change. And, you know, one of the other great things that Mark Twain says, aside from many great things, I've read his unabridged memoirs. And he has a long paragraph there that says, we will never know what someone is thinking when they do it. He says, the mind is a very complex thing. He says, there's very little we know about motivation. And then he says something like, but watch their feet. Where are they going? What are they doing? Who pays for their corn pawn? You know, he tells you to look for the 
the pews. See, I don't care. Mm. What you know, story I, I, I think about? I think that Chairman what's Kim? really great about your your whole uh, your your idea of learning philosophy and history hand in hand, the way that I kind of see that, I think I think that philosophy encourages us to really go within ourselves, right? To really question our own motives and try to to aim at things that are real. And when you do that, you learn what you're like, right? And when you learn about history, you you learn what the rest of humanity is like. And, and when you study That's them true. both together, I, I really think that what you come to is you're exactly the same as everybody else. <laughs> like when you study yourself and when you study history, what you realize is that, man, I'm no different to all these people. I, I don't like annoying people. I otherize other people. I, you know, I'm deceitful. I'm annoying. I'm, I'm a terrible person. Man, that could be me. And what philosophy does for you is it says, you need to make sure that you go within yourself enough to recognize when you're becoming one of those people so that you don't, when those times come. And that's why I really think that it's so important for people to study philosophy today, because we need more people to be paying attention to themselves and how they're acting. Right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, comfort on that thought. When I was young and I didn't know one scholar from the other, when I was 19 and 20, I, I got to meet and listen to uh, Arnold Toynbee, a challenge and response guy. I got to meet the great nationalist historian, Hans Kohn, who the seminar I attended for uh, 12 weeks. And then I attended another seminar for 12 weeks by a guy named Karl Popper. And I'm sitting in this philosophy class. I had to have a philosophy class to get out of the university. I'd already taken metaphysics, which was a disaster. <laughs> so I'm listening to Popper. And, and, and on the first day, and here's this popper who's this European Jew who winds up in New Zealand, couldn't have had a job in Australia, but University of Queensland knocked him back. <laughs> you love that one? The anti-Semitism was well at work and when he was looking for a job in the 30s. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this class with Karl Popper. I don't know he's famous, okay? I, I just don't know he's famous. So this kid says to him, kid from the University of Denver, he says, why, why should we study philosophy? What is philosophy? And Popper looks at this guy and he says, philosophy is throwing a brick through the window to let in some fresh air. And I never forgot what he said. <laughs> it was just beautiful. Oh, it was about brilliant. throwing the fucking bricks through the window and letting in the fresh air. So in addition to introspective, Popper is saying, you got to throw a glass through the window to get, in, to, to get the ideas again, you know, to get the fresh air. I mean, it was yeah. a beautiful comment. And you know, it's funny like that. You never forget those beautiful moments. Mm. Now that's, that's, oh man, that's such a good story. I'm going to keep that with me forever as well. No, you uh, steal that one. You steal that one. Oh, I will. <laughs> well, look, uh, now I've done all the talking. Have you, you want to ask a question? <laughs> no, this really Joe, hasn't been a I, Q and A. All you've done was let me go off at the, the leash here. Well, what I will say is that I only have one more question for you and it has to do sure. with the original reason why I actually found you, right? And it's North Korea. Um, and, and before I ask this question, I have to say, I want to have you back on the podcast many more times so that we can continue these sorts of discussion. Cause you know, like I, I, I know that, you know, with a guest like yourself, we could, we could just stick to one specific topic and we could get so much value out of this discussion. Well, this is um, very therapeutic for me because I'm not going to write my memoirs. I promised all the famous people I've known that I wasn't going to write my memoirs. That's why they talked to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is, no, I love this it. is, I get to talk about my memoirs without actually publishing them. Okay. So uh -huh. it's, it's therapeutic for me too. Well, just know that we're going to have you back many more times if, if you'll come back on. But uh, what I wanted to ask about is I, I saw you talking about uh, North Korea and man, I have been very fascinated with North Korea for quite some time now. And in preparation for today's interview, I kind of went and, and watched two hour long documentaries about it last night. And it was interesting because one documentary seemed to paint it in, in quite a pretty picture, not a pretty, not as if it's like a great place, but they're on the up and up and things are going okay for them now. The other one was completely the opposite, which I think was good. I think it was good that I got both of those perspectives. Right. Um, and I, I can almost guarantee that it's leaning more towards the bad, but let's just say, I, I know that this is all speculation at the moment, but let's just say, for example, in the spirit of negative visualization, like the Stoics would want, that uh, that Kim Jong Un 
basically is is dead or will be dead. Um, what happens in North Korea over the time after he dies, and what can the rest of the world expect? Well, did you uh, did you have high school physics? I had high school physics in the in the second in the second year of high school with Mr. O'Connor, and the first thing he told us about physics was that nature abhors a vacuum. And then we explore that, that possibility in different things. Any totalitarian regime abhors a vacuum if the leadership follows. And the reason everyone's being cagey as hell about this, if he's dead or if he's in a coma, those who want to seize power better make pretty goddamn sure he's dead. This guy wakes up and finds out who claimed the throne. They're going to be in trouble. And you know, they got the three generation rule in North Korea, that if you screw up, three generations of your family go to prison with you. Okay? You know that yeah. rule? Or killed. Call right. the priest. And, 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 and so uh, there is always a power vacuum. Now, when I was at University of Vienna, I studied what happened after Joseph Stalin died. You know, the collective leadership that then fought it out until one party, one person like Khrushchev came along uh, years later. But, but there's an internal struggle. And it's about who leads and who's allowed to lead. So you could, you could dream about being a general secretary or something, but you got to have all your ducks in a row. And I think one of the big players in, 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 in uh, North Korea are the military. Uh, in a way, um, Kim serves their purposes. I like to say that, uh, you know, uh, I'll say what the New York Times said, that when Kim wakes up in the morning, he must be a very happy man because he's one of the few dictators in the world who could be shot at night by the, his military, and they'll say he had a stroke or a heart attack. They've been saying this for mm-hmm. years because if he pisses them off, he's in trouble. Now, when, when he was with Trump, you could just feel the tension. He gave Trump too much. The military would, would shoot him in the head when he got home. If he didn't give Trump enough, Trump was going to destroy North Korea. This guy's between a rock and a hard place, though I don't feel sorry for him, okay? And mm-hmm. so what to give and what not to give, and uh, he has to be very, very careful. So it's a communist dynasty, so you got to have the Kim blood, and, you know, you got to be born on that mountain somewhere, maybe. He's got three children, according to the New York Times. I've, I've known what, North Korea watchers who've been looking at Korea for 50 years, and they didn't know he had three sons or he had three children. But the New York yeah. Times confirms that he had the three kids. And uh, uh, so I think there'd be some kind of regency set up. I think his sister might uh, weigh in a little bit. Uh, she might have it to provide some legitimacy. But I think it would be a collective leadership in the first instance until they shake down who the actual leader is going to be, okay? And that might take four to five years. Now, in the meantime, the North Koreans who are always on, you know, DEFCON 4, they're always going to be afraid of regime change. They might think that this is the moment that the United States swoops in, grabs the arsenal, and uh, executes or chops off the command and control people. They might even be worried about China coming back and picking up these bombs. China doesn't want these people running loose all over the place. And, of course, the uh, (laughs) I had breakfast with a Japanese admiral who can't wait to go to war with Korea. North Korea, the Japanese military are not afraid of the Chinese or the North Koreans. They're really, uh, you know, the code of the Bushido has risen in Japan, which is one of the great secrets over there. Anyway, uh, I, I think there'll be a collective leadership, and there'll be one guy who comes out on top, but he'll be dependent on two or three elements in society, whether it's the party, the military, or the bureaucracy, whatever. That explains Khrushchev's rise to power, uh, Joe and Lai's rise to power later on. I mean, it explains certain things. So look for uh, a long period of not seeing this guy. In fact, the longer we don't see him, I figure the more the leadership is fighting. Uh, the military and other people, are, are they're not actually fighting. They are maneuvering for position, just in case, mm. just in case. Yeah. Uh, look, he might show up tomorrow. That's fine. Maybe he's afraid of COVID-19 and he ducked for cover. I don't know. But it's a regime that's all about optics. If you are not seen, it means something. If you are seen, it means something. You know, when I was studying 
uh, Soviet system of government. And I was laboring in German to understand, you know, uh, Feuerbach and uh, dialectical materialism. And, and languages are not easy for me. And this guy's teaching Sovietology. And he says to us, class of 50 kids all from all over the world, he says to us, the most important thing to understand about the Soviet Union is on May Day, you look at the photographs in the newspaper. The head of the general secretary will always be first in line. And the people to his left will be second in line, third in line. This is the unnamed succession. So you look at the pictures, whether it's a Chinese uh, president coming to visit North Korea or whatever it is. You look at who's in the frame. The last time a Chinese leader was there, I think uh, Kim's sister was seventh in the queue. Maybe that was one way or the other, but I know she has greeted him. And so now, uh, so there, there'll be a power struggle. And if he doesn't survive, there might even be a, a outright coup behind the scenes, but we'll never know about it. The, the, the longer the North Koreans are silent, the more convinced I am that something's going on. Look, if they don't like something, if they don't like what you and I are saying, they'll condemn us in the, in the press tomorrow, you know, in their own the news release. Say, oh, you know, bad mouth in North Korea again. But you don't hear anything. And the South Koreans are terrified of being accused of destabilizing. They have a unification minister who wants to unify the peninsula. And he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to disturb these people. So the longer it's quiet, the more I'm convinced something's going on. Now we go back to Mark Twain. If we, if we see what's going on, we're never going to know exactly what the motivation is in the individuals over there, okay? Hmm. So now we go back to the, the people who connect the dots. Watch their feet. Where are they sitting? Are they in charge of the military and missiles or, you know, operational control, whatever it is? So you, you start to look at the movement. I'm, I'm very interested in, in moving parts. Somebody said to me, you know, you're not a great Russian expert. How would you know anything about Russian nuclear weapons? I said, well, I, I look at the declassified as it becomes available to the public. I look at their satellite imagery. And if I see there's a concentration of weapons here, and I see that there are brigades there that they mount them on these tanks, then you know that's a mobile unit. And they, you know that the Soviets are very good about military doctrine. They tell you when they're going to use things that most people do with declaratory policy. So I, I'm, I'm looking at the moving parts. In North Korea, we got a train that's on the move. He probably has 20 doubles. So we don't know anything about who's anywhere. Uh, but they would know him in the party, which is why he didn't show up for grandpa's birthday party. And so uh, we, we got rumors of this and that. But nobody has denied that he had heart surgery. Uh, the only things now are what kind of shape is he in? Was he waiting for stents or was he waiting for a heart transplant? Uh, did it go sideways? Maybe he picked up a pathogen while in the hospital. God knows what they're like. I've heard uh, travelers to North Korea saying that their hospitals, even their best ones, are dreadful. Uh, they're not mm -hmm. they're not sanitized properly. So uh, uh, there will be a quiet struggle and maybe a larger struggle, but there isn't going to be fighting in the streets. This is going to be done very quickly behind scenes. And uh, I'd say with an army of 2.2 million, uh, 70,000 will do whatever the, the chief says. Uh, he can probably command the respect of everybody. Uh, the rest might kind of melt away. They're certainly not going to stick the necks so. out. And so... Uh, the executions will be swift. People will disappear. You get the new alignment. Uh, and then we go to the next round. But they can't move forward without a Kim on the money. You know, <laughs> Remember, the family has got to be there somewhere. Now, mm -hmm. early on, the uncle uh, was killed by Kim. Not because he didn't like the uncle. It's because the Chinese liked the uncle. Kim always thought that the uncle might be used by the Chinese to install their own puppet. So he had to disappear. And the aunt disappeared for a while. I saw her that she's come back. And so he's got the, uh, the stepbrother he didn't trust. Uh, and he had some other people that disappeared. So he got rid of the family people. He killed about 300 to 500 people. But nobody who hadn't been reported by the military. In fact, everybody he got rid of had the approval of the military. He, 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 he's not Nero. He's not a Roman emperor. He, he, he depends on his military. The way Stalin and Hitler depended on their militaries to do their bidding is the same way in North Korea. It is a standard authoritarian regime. And I think the reason why it fascinates us is because it is 
ah, it's a wa- walking back in time. It is a Stalinist country in the year 2020. We're looking at a country that looks like 1949 in mm-hmm. terms of... Uh, it's people and it's training and all the rest of it. Now, the, the North Koreans, let's see, 49 to 2020. I told you, Bolshevism only lasted 73 years. Chinese are celebrating their 70th anniversary. The party, their 100th year, they might not make it. A lot of things might not happen. So is there anything about the North Koreans that might surprise us? I was talking to a religious scholar one night. And he said in the 19th century, evangelicals regarded the North Koreans as the best prospect, prospect for, for Christianity in Asia. There were many, many converts. In fact, the original leader over there used a number of kind of ministerial techniques and pulpit techniques to round up the troops or to send messages. And so he said that the, the 19th century, late 19th century evangelicals uh, had a lot of time for uh, North Korea. They thought it was susceptible to proselytization. And they actually, uh, a number of reports referred to uh, Penang Young as the Jerusalem of the Far East. And I thought, now that's interesting. Uh, the evangelicals picked them for people who got poorest minds. That is people who can buy a story. And so, uh, you know, the kings live on this ability to mold these minds. So you get third, fourth, fifth generation North Koreans. And the kids get smaller. Their knees are bent. People don't look right. In the Army, you might get rations of 800 calories a day. Uh, I heard a top American admiral, Admiral Harry Harris, gave us a briefing in Brisbane uh, about two years ago. And he, he was leading that, uh, that, uh, that strike group on, on North Korea. You know, it's the one put up or shut up. He, I wanted to look in his face. He had no trouble going to war with North Korea because he... Uh, and he said he didn't care who was in the White House, by the way. He had his, he had his orders. And um, he said to us, the North Korean army, which is several millions, has a core group of 70,000 who will fight in the last man. These are the Praetorian guards. These are the immortals that surrounded the Persian emperors. Mm-hmm. He said after that, they would all take off. You know, to have the admiral of the Seventh Fleet tell me to my face that he thought that North Korean army was a house of cards was a revelation to me. You know, <laughs> we don't think that they're these super fighters. Well, the seven, you know, 700,000, 70,000 might be. But as soon as you get past these guys, if you take out the command and control, I think the rest will be headed for the hills. We'll be pouring across the Chinese border. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, uh, I forget what the original question was. <laughs> no, I, no I, you've answered it. Yeah, definitely. Because I was, I was just wondering, yeah, basically you know, what we can expect. And, 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 and I think that it's so, so interesting to hear from somebody like yourself, who is, you know, who has paid a lot of attention to these kinds of regimes has paid a lot of attention to, uh, you, you know, like North Korea at the moment. And um, I, I think it's just, it's just, it's just one of these times, you know, if I could sum up this interview, it's just one of these interesting times where we all need to be particularly vigilant to the way that we are showing up in the world and also to the to the um, I guess the fallacy that it's not going to happen to me. Um, we need to be prepared, uh, at least mentally, for the idea that crazy things can and probably will happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Well, you know, um, Simon, what I, I like to say to my uh, students when I leave them at the end of the year, uh, I, I give them two thoughts. One is by Langston Hughes, uh, the black writer during the Black Renaissance in Harlem or Harlem Renaissance, who says in his memoirs, you know, when, when uh, discrimination and racism came roaring back at the end of the First World War, he says, you know, we had a good time while it lasted, but it never lasts forever. It's the same thing with mm-hmm. democracy. It, it's a good time while it lasts. And, and the second thing is, I like to point out to younger students, particularly young Australian students, that if um, they don't solve the problems, if they don't connect the dots, that we're doomed. And someone would say to me, how do you know that? I said, I know. I'll tell you how I know that. I guess because there have been ancient civilizations which are far smarter, which were far smarter than we'll ever be, who disappeared from the face of the earth, okay? Mm-hmm. People who understood the wheel and ancient warfare and how things work, the world works. And we're, we're not as smart as they are. And they just disappeared because they couldn't connect the dots. See, that's our obligation. So, you know, at the end of the day, give me somebody 
you know, who, who understands the Game of Thrones rather than somebody who wants a bloody degree in engineering. All right, so there you have it, my interview with Professor Joseph Siracusa. Now, I want to have him back many more times because I'm sure that we could delve into any one of the topics that he mentioned for for quite a long time. Just so so much knowledge there, and so much uh, uh, so much historical knowledge, which is so great, and and that mixed with philosophy, as we discussed, is such a great pair. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, and I'll talk to you next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.